Hey, uh, so far, uh, we are month in now. This is our fourth Sunday with our new lead pastors, Jeff and Kristen, and we've gotten to hear from one half of that team, and uh, today we get to hear from the better half, as uh, Jeff would say, and that is Kristen. So Kristen, as you come up, I just... (laughs) There is no bigger cheerleader in this room than your husband, which I love. I know, And so. in addition to being one of our lead pastors, you are also in the marketplace. You work yes. as a director of marketing for Subsplash, and so you are super busy, and uh, we are thankful that you are sharing the word with us this morning. So I want to turn this over to you. Thanks, Adam. Right. Appreciate you. Isn't Adam the best? Yes. Yes. Well, good morning, Lake Sam. I am excited to be with you all this morning. Welcome online. I wish I could see you in person. If we haven't gotten to meet yet, I long for the day where we get to be together face to face. But for now, this will do. So, as Adam mentioned, we are in a new series right now called Stir It Up, Stirring Up the Gift of God in us. It's out of 2 Timothy 1.6. And this is paired with our 21 days of prayer and fasting that we're in as a church as well. And so as Adam mentioned, we're in week four, and if you would have asked me if I would have thought I would have been teaching on week four as lead pastors in a new church, I would have laughed at you. I would have said, absolutely not, no way. So when the team asked me, Jeff and the team asked me about a week and a half ago, hey, do you want to teach? I was like, No, (laughs) not because I don't love talking about Jesus and not because I don't love talking about his word, but a week and a half, I was like, oh my gosh, this muscle is not strong enough. I am not prepared in a week and a half. I probably had one of the busiest weeks of my life this last week, and I was like, this this will be awful. I can't do this. And so they asked me, and I said, okay, I'll, I'll ask God. And I was really stubborn for the first few days. I actually probably four days into this week and a half, and I knew I was running the clock out. I was like, okay, if I don't say yes fast, I'm actually limiting the time I get to study and prepare and ask God. So I was not asking him for like, a God, do you want me to do this? I was actually asking him because I was like, God, can I say no? Like, is it okay? Can you give me permission to say no? So I was sitting there, I was like, God, just tell me I can ask someone else, like put some on my heart. Never did. And so here I am. I am preaching on week four what God has put on my heart over this last week. And speaking of questions, I've just been asking God a lot over these last two weeks, I guess, because have you ever asked God those questions and said like, okay, God, I really need you to answer me. I really need you to respond. But really in your head, you're like, God, this is a rhetorical question and I actually don't want you to answer. Like, let me just keep living my life. Zero conviction, zero change. Like, we'll just keep going with the status quo. Well, I asked God one of these questions in a seemingly insignificant moment, blow drying my hair. I asked God, God, why do I have such a hard time fasting food? Because on top of teaching and preparing a message in a week and a half, fasting, if I'm being totally honest, is probably one of the lower spiritual disciplines and practices that I feel familiar and comfortable with. And so for someone to say, hey, preach in a week and a half and preach on fasting, I was like, okay, (laughs) great. I have pages and pages in my journal for this moment. Zero, none, nothing. I was like, God, I need you to give me something. Like, and so it started with this question, and he responded, even though I did not want him to. He responded in an instant, and he said, Kristen, you have such a hard time with fasting because you don't like the feeling of underperforming. And I was like, ouch. I was like, what do you mean? And really what I was like, God, we have been on this journey together for the last like probably five plus years where the Lord has really worked with me and this need and this burden to perform in a church and in a ministry context. And in that moment, I was like, God, I overcame this. Like, what are you talking about? And he was like, no, you didn't. You just feel like you're on a path to overcoming it in one area of your life, but you have this whole other area of your life where you're still carrying the burden to perform. And I was like, I was like, okay, okay, fine, well, okay. And then he was, and then we just started this conversation because it sounds kind of crazy as I'm dialoguing it right now, but if you guys have had moments with God, you know they're just kind of these natural, like, free-flowing form of your own thoughts. And so... He was like, you have this burden to perform. And then it got to the point where I was like, oh, okay, so I guess 
overcoming isn't always all-encompassing and holistic. Sometimes we actually have to walk out this journey where certain roots have died and other roots are being uprooted in other areas of our lives. And so we actually have not overcome, in my case, a performing mentality. And so as I'm having this conversation with God, I have this awareness and it's like, oh, we preach this overcoming, conquering gospel in our Western churches. We say, you can do it. You can overcome it. You can persevere. Just keep on going. And hear me, that is true. We do have an overcoming spirit that says, you can trample death under your feet. You can bind and loose. You can heal and set free. But we only carry that spirit because we first surrendered to the one who overcame. You see, Jesus was sent by, the, by God in heaven, the almighty God, sent his son to earth to surrender to a cross, to, be, to carry the weight of our sins on that cross so that he could overcome death, so that we could choose to surrender to him and therefore overcome death and enter into eternity. So I don't carry an overcoming spirit or mentality just because I'm awesome. No, I carry an overcoming spirit because I first made the decision to surrender to the one who overcame. And that's a glimpse of what fasting is, right? It's saying, okay, God, I'm going to surrender my flesh, my mind, body, and soul to you during this time so that I can overcome my flesh and carry your spirit. Because this whole conversation ended with God saying, Kristen, is my spirit not good enough? Is my spirit not strong enough? And guys, if I'm being honest, I had to say no. I had to say, God, it's not. Monday through Friday, my job, I feel more confident in what my spirit can bring and what my performance can bring and what my strength can be. And relying on you means I might be cranky, I might be angry, I might be impatient, I might be foggy at work. And so I had to say, God, no, it's not. It's not good enough. And he said, okay, let's work with that. So that's where I am. On this 21 days of prayer and fasting, I told God his spirit wasn't good enough, okay? So (laughs) you're probably doing good. (laughs) But in this place, he brought me to Isaiah 58, which we see the Israelites, this group of people, kind of wrestling with a really similar pattern, a really similar behavior. They're wrestling with this performance mentality actually when it specifically comes to the area of fasting. And we're going to read Isaiah 58 together, but before we dive into that, I want to give some cultural context, some background to not only the book of Isaiah, but also what the Israelites would be seeing in this time. So throughout the Bible, we see this biblical narrative, this pattern, if you will, where we see God either speaking directly to his people or sending someone on his behalf to speak to his people. In this case, the book of Isaiah is a prophet. And so God is either comes to his people or sends someone and says, usually like, okay, I see an area of correction and I'm going to offer conviction, okay? So I see this area where you're just maybe not getting it quite right, so let's just move it over a little bit and I'm going to offer correction and conviction. Conviction. And then following correction and conviction, we see this restoration, we see this comfort, it's awesome. And then we see humanity go right back into their original patterns. And God's like, didn't we just, I thought we, I comforted you, you felt awesome, you felt good. We just talked about this, I saw a behavior change, and now we're back again? All the parents are like, sounds a lot like parenting. <laughs> because the truth is, this is the human condition, right? This is our human heart in action. And we see this pattern, Israelites, which we'll see, which we're going to talk about today. We also see this pattern with the disciples. We see this pattern a lot throughout the Bible. And the book of Isaiah actually follows this exact same narrative. The beginning of the book of Isaiah is this correction, this conviction. Then the middle is a little more upbeat. It's offering restoration and comfort. It's like, you will soar on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow faint. You're like, yes. (laughs) And then the end, which lucky us, that's where we're going to be today. The end is God coming back around and going, wait a second. Why are we back here again? I thought we talked about this, you guys. And so this is kind of the pattern that the book of Isaiah follows. And we're going to be in 58, which is towards the end. And in 58 specifically, it's in most translations, it's got a title, something along the lines of true fasting, or in the message, it's how to get your prayers off the ground. And the latter half is about Sabbath. But 
to understand what the Israelites were actually facing and walking with when it comes to the specific discipline of fasting, it's important to know what it was like for them in this time. Okay, so fasting in this time in Isaiah 58 for the Israelites was actually way more of a holiday. Cannot fathom a world where not eating is a holiday. We're a little bit opposite these days, but for them, it was a holiday. It was a religious gathering where they actually got to go to the church, flock to the temple, and actually got to feel good about themselves. They have celebrated in this way through fasting because they could perform well and because they found personal pleasure in it, not because God asked them to. And so you see this shift where fasting actually becomes something that they're doing out of their own flesh, out of personal desire, not out of obedience towards God. And during this time, it was very unstable socially and economically. There was a lot of opportunistic oppression. There was really heavy taxes and really poor administration. And so you see these Israelites flock to the temple, flock to prayer, flock to fasting, not as a means to live out the gospel in action, but actually as a refuge and a safety from the turmoil that they were experiencing in their current context. And so, as we dive into Isaiah 58 together, I want you to listen. I want you to lean in. Think less about fasting and actually listen to see if you can hear what Isaiah 58 says pleases the heart of God. Okay, we're going to start from Isaiah 58.1. Are you ready? ready? Ready. Okay, let's go. Shout it out loud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. Already off to an awesome start. Sorry, I'm not reading. You will soar on wings like eagles. (laughs) For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that did what is right and had not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and they seem eager for God to come near to them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't even noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I've chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is, it what, is this what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is, it not, is, it, is not this the kind of fast I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter, when you see the naked to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood? We are going to end in seven. You see... Isaiah 58 is not merely just about fasting or even about Sabbath, if you keep reading. It's not a humanitarian message or a social justice message. It is actually a passage about what pleases the heart of God and aligns us with his heart. Yeah. Will you guys join me as we pray over today's word? Well, Jesus, I just thank you. God, I thank you that you are quick to convict the areas of my heart that you see that are just a little bit off. Jesus, I thank you that your word is alive and active. Jesus, I just pray that anything that I say today that is not from you, Jesus, it would just fall to the wayside. God, and anything that is from you, divinely purposed for this moment, Jesus, would it bear deep, deep roots in our heart and would it bear lasting and everlasting fruit. Jesus, I just thank you for this moment that we get to have to learn together, to lean in, to walk away with what pleases your heart. Jesus, and I pray that it would lead to lasting transformation. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you are taking notes today, the title of my message is The Rules or the Way. The Rules or the Way. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have become avid game players during quarantine. Jeff and I probably go through like ebbs and flows where we're all about board games and then we probably don't play them for months. If you have a new board game that you're loving to play online, send it in. I will grab the list from our hosts and and Jeff and I, if they're good of course, will buy all the games you suggest. So send in the games that you are playing. We're in need of some new games. But what I have learned is there are two types of people that sit down to play a new game. The first person says, 
the person sitting down and they're like, okay, I'm gonna teach you how to play. And they're like, no, 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 no. No, I don't want to know the rules. I don't know. Let's just play and I'll figure it out. Jeff is this person. The second person says, okay, I have two questions. What are the rules and how do I win? That's me. I want to know, okay, if I'm going to even play this game, well, how do I play and what's the purpose? How do I win? Because rules make sense to me. I get rules. I understand rules. Because rules lead to expectations and standards. They show me, okay, where's the bar? What's the minimum? What do I have to hit? And then it leads to my behavior. So rules dictate my expectations and therefore my behavior. Rules are a lot like religion. And I get religion. Religion says, what are the rules and how do I gain eternity? Better yet, what are the rules and how do I gain the approval of God? The Israelites also got rules. They understood the rules of religion. But God, you guys, God is so much interested, so much more interested in going deeper, so much more interested in the actual condition of our hearts than any of our behavior. And so he wanted to show the Israelites a better way. He wanted to show them the way of relationship. But what does this look like? It's like, okay, rules, great. Rules aren't bad. You know, like, I don't see the problem with rules. I love rules. Sitting in service last Sunday, I was asking the Lord, what do you want me to say to your people? And he's like, Kristen, you get religion, you get rules. And I was like, ouch. Okay, you're right, I do. I get it, it makes sense to me. Relationship, on the other hand, is like, really messy and crosses boundaries as an countercultural and counterintuitive to any rule I would know, and it bridges the gaps, and it's radical. So what does religion and what does relationship actually look like lived out? Well, you see, re- the rules of religion would say, I attend church because that's just what I've always done. Or I attend church, but I have no intention of letting God search my heart. Wow. The way of relationship would say, I attend church with no expectations that I will receive anything. There's no box that gets to check that it was a good Sunday or a bad Sunday based on my own whims, but I actually recognize that me participating in a service is actually a way for me to honor and glory God, and I can get nothing out of it. The way of religion, the rules of religion would say, I tithe my 10%, but I have no, I'm not compelled to give to anyone else, to anyone in need. I'm not compelled to help that family I know that I've heard has been struggling. I'm not compelled to help that homeless man that's sitting on the corner every single day I drive to my house. I'll just give my 10% and I'll, I'll be done. The way of relationship says, I'll give my 10% and I'll actually give everything above and beyond that because nothing is really mine in the first place. It's all God's and I'm just caring for it until the day Jesus returns. The rules of religion would say, when looking at the lives of others, least I'm not that bad, or I would never do that. (laughs) Them, I would never do that. The way of relationship would say, I am so broken, I am so flawed, and the only one more whole and perfect than me is Jesus. The rules of religion would say, I serve, and it has to fit my schedule, it has to fit my vacation time, it has to fit my desires, it has to fit my needs. If I don't feel like I'm getting enough validation from man, then I'll probably just stop. The way of relationship says, I know that God has given me gifts uniquely for me. I will use them however he asks me, always for the benefit of the kingdom of another, never for the benefit of ourselves. The rules of religion would say, yeah, I'll fast, but probably just because everyone else is doing it and I don't want to feel left out. Or I'll fast, but better not ask me to give up that one thing. Food. I'm with you. But the way of relationship would say, I actually am so excited to fast because I'm longing to be emptied of everything that feels like my flesh and be filled with everything that looks like Jesus. The rules of religion know why we follow but the way of relationship knows who we follow. They're cheering me on in the room, you guys, if you can't hear them. (laughs) Because you see, relationship should lead us to transformation and transformed lives reflect God. And so we see this wrestle all the way throughout Isaiah 58. The Israelites are like, do I choose religion? Do I choose relationship? I don't even know what relationship looks like. And God's like, I'm trying to show you. 
And so we see in verse 1, it says, Shout it out loud, do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob's their sin. Isaiah was not instructed to flatter the Israelites. He wasn't like, hey, send them a text, shoot them an email. If you bump into them in the hall, maybe let them know they're missing it. No, he said, raise your voice like a trumpet. Now, trumpets in this time would have a piercing blast. They were used to either gra- gather people for communal activity or to gather the attention of people for cause of concern. But there is no way you would have missed this trumpet. There is no way. It would have caused your attention. You would have been doing something And you would have stopped and gone, I hear the trumpet. What's going on? And so as we're here today, maybe the Lord is already tapping on your heart. Maybe he hasn't yet. But as we continue to go through what the Lord would teach us today, I would challenge us. Ask us, God, where are you trying to get my attention? God, where are you trying to get the attention of your church? Where are you trying to get the attention for my family, for my personal life, for your world, for your people? Because he's asking us. He's calling our attention. And that is why we are on this 21 days of prayer and fasting. Because the Lord has asked something and we are responding so that he can show us the way. And so in your own life, I would challenge you, if you have not yet, Ask God, God, where are you trying to get my attention? We see this then go on, and God's telling Isaiah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get their attention, and then here's here's the situation. In verse 2, for day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions, and they seem eager for God to come near them. The message says, the message translation, I'm reading out of NIV. I don't think I said that. My apologies. I'm reading out of NIV. Verse 2 of the message says, they're busy, busy, busy at worship, and they love studying all about me. To all appearances, they're a nation of right living people, law-abiding, God-honoring. They ask me, what is the right thing to do? And they love having me on their side. How often are we too busy doing good things for God that we actually completely bypass being in a relationship with God. We're so busy, busy, busy doing good things. Catch this. They were praying, you guys. They were in the temple, the church. They were reading their Bible. They loved good teaching. And God does not condemn them. He does not say, missed it. Those things are terrible, actually, and I never want you to do them. No, no, no. He doesn't say that. He just is getting at something deeper. Because if you catch the language in the scripture, it says to all appearances or as if. He's saying, look, guys, on the outside, it looks like you've got it together. On the outside, you're praying, you're worshiping, you're doing all these things, but I'm a little concerned with the condition of your heart because it's as if you're my follower. It's to all appearances, it would look like you know me, but I'm actually questioning the fruit in your life. Because how many of us know, and I can attest to this, grew up in a household like this, mom and dad, if you're online, I love you, should have asked you if I could share this before, but I'm going to anyway, grew up in a household where behind closed doors, it was a little rocky. But as soon as we stepped outside of those doors, it was, we were that family. We were gregarious, we were fun, we were the Gelman family. Our name carried weight, just like actually the Israelites. And so we can look as if we're followers of Jesus, but behind closed doors, we're greedy, we're lustful, we're envious, we resent God, we're bitter, as if we were following God. They had the expression of fasting down, but God, again, was concerned with something deeper. He was concerned with the heart. Then in verse 3, their response. So God's like, okay, here's what you're doing. Here's your expression. Here's your behavior. And then verse three is my favorite, you guys, if this is not humanity. Why have we fasted, they said, and you have not seen it. Why have we humbled ourselves and you haven't even noticed? God, hello, I have fasted. I've prayed. I've done all these things. And where's my compliment? Like you haven't even told me I did a good job. 
The Israelites were desperate for God to take notice of their performance because performance will always be self-glorifying, it will always be self-promoting, and it will always be self-centered. Guys, I'm preaching to myself here. So, (laughs) And whenever we live from this performance-driven religious lifestyle, we're actually saying that it will result in the belief that we're owed something for our labor, our duty, or even our religion. They even charged God himself with injustice. God himself, you guys. They said, there's no profit in it for us, so we're just going to throw it off. Why bother? There's no profit. When we're consumed with performance and the rules of religion, we live with the expectancy that God himself owes us a compliment. You guys, I am preaching to myself here. God, why do I have a problem with fasting? I'll just give up something that's like really hard, like social media. Maybe social media is really hard for you. You have to search your heart. For me, it's not. I knew the hardest thing to give up was food. And so I'm saying, God, I'm going to give up social media at the end of the fast. Aren't you proud of me? I did so good. I gave up social media for 21 days. Where's my honor? Where's my recognition? And he's like, yeah, 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 I get that. I'm not condemning your actions, but was that really the hardest thing for you to give up? And was there any ex- extension of the expression that you were living out? And it's like, no, sorry I asked. <laughs> and so we see this, they're wrestling, they're like, God, we did all this and you didn't even care. And then God responds, Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and you exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this not the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? What, what, oh, Is that what you call a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? You see, the rules of religion for a fast will say, don't eat, go to church, and make sure you have the right appearance and behavior. Who's felt like that going to church? Hello? I felt that way. I felt like, okay, got to have the right language, got to look the right part, got to make sure I understand what they're saying, and then, then I can go to church, and then check. And that's what the rules of religion for fasting are. That's it. But in this passage, it's saying... The Israelites are saying, okay, I'll do that, God, but actually, I don't need my heart to be changed, right? Like, I can just do that and be good. I don't need transformation to actually take root in my heart. I can just call it, call it quits there. Because their, their expression was right, but their heart was wrong. Hear me, I don't want us walking away and thinking, so I don't fast? So I don't pray? So I don't go to church? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that our expression can be right, but our heart can actually be sincerely wrong all at the same time. Because the rules of religion will always get in the way of relationship. Isaiah 58 is even in some interesting ways a parallel and a foreshadowing to what we'll see when Jesus enters on this earth. So we see these Israelites, they're living out the rules of religion, and they're being given an opportunity to live out relationship. And this is kind of what happened when Jesus comes on the scene. We see these Pharisees that are living out the rules of religion their whole life. They've been taught these things. They've been taught these practices. They've been taught these ways of living. And then Jesus comes onto the scene, and he's so counterintuitive to anything their religion would have taught them. He actually is disrupting their religion. He's actually pushing back. He's not saying, no, 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 the law is not bad. I'm not saying don't do those things, but I'm asking you, why do you do them in the first place? And they completely miss Jesus. Consumed with religion that they don't. An extension of who Jesus Christ is when he's here on this earth. And so we keep going and then Jesus, God goes, okay, so this is what you do. I know you're completely. And then I'm going to break it down. I'm going to say, this is why. This is why I don't compliment you. And then I'm not going to leave you hanging there. I'm going to show you what fast is actually pleasing to the Lord. So in 6 and 7, it says, it's not this kind of fasting I have chosen. 
Is this not the kind of fasting I've chosen? To loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them and to not turn away from your own flesh and blood. This is my one big point. If you walk away with anything today, I want you to walk away with the type of fast, or better yet, the type of lifestyle God is looking for is the expression and the extension of the kingdom of God. The expression and the extension. We can live with this expression of prayer, worship, reading my Bible, living in community, all these different things, and they're not wrong. But if we miss the extension of the kingdom of God living on earth through us, we've actually missed it. We've actually missed it. Just like we know in the context of this time, the Israelites flocked to the temple not as a way to be an extension of the kingdom of God, but actually to self-protect from their own challenges of the current moment. And so they weren't saying, okay, God, I'm going to go to your temple, I'm going to fast, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to go change the world for you. I'm going to radically impact this space so that people can know you, and I'm going to turn this thing upside down so that more people are added to your kingdom. No. They said, I'm going to do these things because it makes me feel good, and then I'm going to go home. Done. Check. I follow you. And God is saying, no, 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 no. Do that, but then also Fight for justice, fight for freedom, clothe the poor, feed the widow, care for your neighbor, the stranger, and for your family. Because you see, the problem was I didn't want my fast to be uncomfortable, if I'm being honest. That was the problem. I could have given up social media, could have given up coffee. Hello, that actually would have been uncomfortable for quite a few days. Um, I could have given up sugar. I could have given up TV. There's all these things I could have given up that would have actually just really afflicted my lifestyle, but they wouldn't actually have afflicted my body. And so what I was saying is, God, I'll do something easy. I'll, you know, it'll be really hard, and I will just surrender social media to you. Then that's it. And I knew in my heart that was not what he was asking me to do. Are you kidding? No. He was not like, yeah, Kristen, you should give that up because it probably won't cost you anything. Yeah, you should give up TV because you're not going to actually even miss it. And so I don't think doing that, you're going to actually have to depend on me at all. And so nothing's going to change. And therefore, yeah, that's what you should do. You should give up that. Nope, that is not what he said. The challenge for me is food because it actually afflicts my mind, my body, and soul. And in order for heart transformation to actually take place, I have to engage in that place. Anything else is just passive. Anything else is just following the rules of religion and telling God, I don't actually want the way of relationship with you. I just want to check my box of religious participation and say, yay me. (laughs) But am I willing to be transformed? That's what I had to ask myself. Am I willing to be transformed? Am I willing to let my expression Expression meaning my prayer, my fasting, my attendance of church, my attendance going to the 21 days of prayer and fasting class on Wednesday. Am I willing to let my expression transform and go deep enough into my heart that it actually transforms my heart and therefore actually lives as an extension of the kingdom of God to my neighbor? It's always for the other. Or am I only willing to let my expression my fasting, my prayer, my attending church, my going to the 21 days of prayer and fasting class, am I only willing to let that be surface level to reveal religious participation, never extending the kingdom of God to anyone else, and then, at the end of it, asking God, what's my compliment, what's my reward for my good behavior? That's what I would have ended at, you guys. At the end of the 21 days in prayer and fasting, if I had not asked God the question, why do I have a hard time with this? If he wouldn't have taken me on this journey, I would have gotten to the end of the 21 days of prayer and fasting, giving up something like social media and TV and said, so God, what'd you reveal to me? Are you so proud of me? Why don't I feel any different? Why don't I actually even feel good? Why don't I even feel like you're near? Why don't I feel like I have any deeper revelation of you and your son and his sacrifice and your spirit in my life and I actually just feel the same? 
that would have been me. That would have been me. I would have operated from a place of religious participation and asked God for my compliment at the end, for doing it the way he asked, but never really letting it transform my heart. Because true expression and extension of the kingdom of God will transform our hearts and cause us to enter into the kingdom of heaven on earth. That's the goal, you guys. If you call yourself a Jesus follower, the goal, although it is really uncomfortable sometimes, really humiliating, crushes your pride. The goal is to say, God, I don't want just the expression of a life of following you. I want a life that actively looks like an extension of following you. I want to see your spirit move through me, transform me, and actually radically change my community and the people I live life with. Not just say, I go to the church, I go to the house of God as a place of refuge in order to religiously participate in the rules of religion, never actually engaging in the way of relationship. And so maybe you're here sitting in this room or online and you're like, good for you, Kristen, that sucks, I'll be praying for you. Prayer is received. <laughs> I gladly receive your prayers. And maybe you're like, it's not me, I'm actually suffering for Christ right now. I'm actually, I know some people are only doing liquids for 40 days. You can pray for them, don't pray for me. Um, I know some people are only eating beans and rice. Some people are emptying themselves for God. And I, my Daniel fast feels weak. But I'm like, Lord, that's what you asked me to do and it's really hard for me. That's great, right? That's the goal. The goal is that it should make you uncomfortable. The goal is that it should challenge and convict a part in your heart and your life that's saying, when you think in your head, what will I fast? You choose the, no, I don't want to. You don't choose the, I could do that. You choose the, no, I don't want to fast that. That's what you choose. And that for me is a Daniel fast. And so you're sitting here and you're like, gosh, I need to change what I'm fasting. Maybe you do. It's not too late. Maybe the Lord's stirring on your heart and you're like, he told me what that thing was a couple days ago or a week ago or before we started. And I said, heck no, absolutely not. And I made up this really awesome plan. My social media, my no sugar, my, I'm detoxing anything toxic, right? You're like really excited. You came up with this whole plan thinking that God didn't actually tell you what he wanted you to do. And so it's not too late. That's one thing I would say. Maybe you're sitting here and you're going, ooh, I didn't want to do it at all because it made me uncomfortable. I didn't even want to do the fast. It's still not too late. God is way more concerned with the condition of our hearts than our behavior. If you walk away with anything, the difference between the rules of religion and the way of relationship is that he is way more concerned with the condition of our heart than our behavior, than the expression of following him. And so let's ask ourselves this. As we wrap up, as we head into week two, maybe you're already dying, <laughs> but let's ask ourselves this. Am I living out the expression and the extension of the kingdom of God through my fast, or am I only living out the expression? Let's ask God. God, am I only living out the rules of religion when it comes to a fast, or am I living out what your word says and allowing it to be an extension through my life for the other, for my neighbor, for my family, for the kingdom of God here on earth. There's two people I wanna pray for today as we close. The first group is maybe you're sitting here and you're like, man, I actually don't think I know Jesus, but this actually feels kind of familiar to me. I've kind of lived my whole life thinking it was my good deeds that got me to God. I've kind of spent my whole life thinking that my expression had to be right in order for me to know Jesus. That I couldn't come to church, that I couldn't encounter his presence, that I couldn't do all of these things unless I followed the rules, got it right, looked the part, check, then I could. No, that is not the case. He offers this invitation to all of us, regardless of the condition of our lives or how we're living out this expression when we meet him. That's what makes it so beautiful. And so if you're in this room today or you're watching online and you're thinking, I don't think I know him. 
I don't think I live in relationship with him. I want to give you the greatest invitation you could ever receive. As I talked about in the beginning, there's this incredible story in the Bible, which we call the gospel, which is actually the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, where God himself sent his son, his one and only son, to earth for us, knowing that we have this brokenness, knowing that we had these wounds and this baggage, just as JJ and the kids talked about earlier, but he wanted to create a bridge, a bridge for you and I to be in relationship with him. And that bridge was his son. So he sent his son here to earth to live on earth 33 years, unnoticed, unrecognizable, and then to enter into his ministry, transforming the world for the kingdom of heaven, living in the way of relationship, turning things upside down for his kingdom. All up until this moment where Jesus knows, he goes, I have to go to this cross. I have to sacrifice my life so that these people, humanity, you and I, can live in right standing and right relationship with him, that we can have the opportunity to enter into eternity. And so he is crucified on this cross. People mourn. They are grieving the loss of their Savior. And then three days later, he raises from the dead in all triumphant glory. And people realize he is who he said he is. He is the one who holds eternity in his hand. And they entered in to relationship with him. And then he ascended into heaven and he sent his Holy Spirit to be our comforter, our comforter and our conviction. And so his life is a gift to us. And it means that we recognize that he is our savior. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and savior, that he died on a cross for your sins and raised from the dead three days later, then you will be saved. And you get to start this incredible journey walking with Jesus. And so if this resounds in your ear, if you're hearing this and it's stirring something in you, and you're wanting to take action, I wanna pray for you. So on the count of three, if you're in this room or you're watching online, if you're in this room, raise your hand. If you're watching online, there's a button that you could hit. I'm gonna be praying for you. Our team wants to pray for you this week. On the count of three, one, two, three. Mm, come on. Jesus is moving in the hearts of his people and I wanna pray for anyone today that gave, made the decision to give their heart to Christ. So Jesus, we just thank you. God, we thank you that you saw us in our most broken places, worthy of giving your life for us, worthy of coming to this earth, dying on a cross so that we could live in purity and in eternity with you. Jesus, I pray, pray that the work that happened in people's hearts is they said, yes, Jesus would not go and finish, that they would find people to connect to, that they would find places to get plugged into, Jesus, and that they would live forever walking with you, learning the way of relationship. The second person I want to pray for in this room is the believer, the person that would say, I follow Jesus, I know his rules. I know him, I get him. Living out the Bible makes sense to me from a religious perspective. I understand how to go to church, all the things I'm supposed to do, all the boxes I'm supposed to check. I understand. I wanna pray for you. I will be praying for me <laughs> while praying for you because this is the journey that God continues to take me on. If you are sitting here going, I get the expression, but I'm lacking the extension. I want it. My heart wants it. I long to be the kingdom on earth. I want to see relationships radically transform people. I want to see broken people sitting at my table. I want to be unafraid to live in the fringes, in the gaps, to be cross-cultural. But you struggle because it comes to, into tension with everything your religious upbringing has taught you. If this is you, I want to pray for you. So if that is you and you're like, Jesus, today I want to start the journey living the way of relationship. I want to be the extension, not only the expression of a life following you. Would you just raise your hand? Come on. This is the beauty of being transformed by Jesus. I'm going to pray for us. Well, Jesus, 
Man, I just thank you that you are slow and tender and gracious with us. Jesus, that you do not condemn us with anger or wrath, but Jesus, you sweetly invite us in. You sweetly and tenderly invite us in to a new way, a better way, a way that radically transforms our hearts. And so Jesus, in this moment, as we raised our hands, as we said, God, that's me, change me. I want to be more like you. As we're in this 21 days of prayer and fasting, Jesus, I pray, God, that you would begin to massage the hearts of your people, that you would begin to transform us to look more like you. And Jesus, would you give us a conviction anytime we're living out of the rules of religion and completely missing the way of relationship? God, would you just tap on our heart? Would you just tap on our heart and remind us, don't, don't miss it. Don't miss the way of following me. We love you, Jesus. We're thankful for your word. We're thank you, thankful that you walk with us and you're slow with us. In your name we pray.